Okay, welcome everybody. It is the 7th of November 2022 and we're here in the finale session of this year's illustrious group of students who pursued the Hamming Challenge, the Hamming course, learning to learn, uh, the art of doing, executing, living, etc., uh, science and engineering. So, powerful group we have. We're we're doing it not just for, as as Amen said, it is not just for the insights to be gained from Hamming and everything he teaches, but we have a, a special extra agenda today. We've been thinking and working, discussing, pushing around, could we make this course an asynchronous distance learning course that others could take? Uh, presumably if the rules allow it, even get credit for. We have an awful lot of naval officers and Marines and civilians and other students who are far away, who are not plugged into the network all the time. We'd like to make these assets available to them when they're able to act so that they can benefit from Richard Hamming's insight. So we're going to record today's session as a trial run for that. Could future students who take this course not only go through some of the regular activities, but but then write their essay, give their presentation, their video and say, Here's what Hamming's ideas mean to me. Here's how they're affecting my research. Here's what I think is worth pursuing further. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to stand clear, and our first speaker today will be John Brewster. Please, John. Hey, uh, good afternoon, John. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. Just a quick little backdrop on, on myself. I'm a NIWIC or Navy Information Warfare Center employee, retired Naval officer. I'm in the Information Sciences PhD program. So when I saw the opportunity to take this class, I, I jumped at it knowing, you know, a little bit that, you know, that Hamming was a well-regarded person who kind of founded the Information Sciences way back starting in the 40s, maybe even before that. So I, I think with that background, I, I just wrote kind of a short essay, and I think it really encapsulates most of my thinking regarding the class. I'm, I'm just going to read that, and and I hope it's helpful for anybody thinking about taking the course. So I kind of frame it as a question. Should you, any student out there, take MV4000 Hamming Learning to Learn? My answer is a resounding yes. What if it's only offered asynchronously? Should you still take it? My, rant, my answer remains a resounding yes, but not exactly for the reasons you might expect. Now, it's only natural that, you know, an information science PhD student like myself would recommend a course you know, concerning the life and works of uh, Richard Dummy Hamming. But, you know, if you think about it, aside from the fact that he's a well-known, accomplished computer scientist, his personal testimony of the pioneering work he did at Bell Labs, you know, is reason enough. He also was a co-worker of several Information Age founders like Claude Shannon, John Tukey, and many, many others. He won the ACM Computing Award or the Turing Award. So he's very, very accomplished. But what I did not expect was that he would be so profound in so many other areas. And I think what I learned a lot from Hamming concerned not just his technical accomplishments, but also his, what I would call human accomplishments, all of the things he discusses regarding moving innovation forward and you know just working with your fellow researchers i i thought proved to be critical insights and anybody in any topic would definitely benefit from this so you know when you, when when i uh, was reading the book throughout the you know hit, the book was titled the art of doing science and engineering learning to learn i found 
many unexpected yet critical insights into the fundamentals of human behavior. You know, they tended to compile. In particular, there was a line from chapter four that the human animal is not reliable. You know, and then he went on and on about how the fallibility of experts, the unreliability of expert data, the fact that managers often cannot see the next step, that managers must be managed by scientists in order to be successful. Yet, in sharp contrast, he also related that what is most essential is in fact human. It, it was really his way of uh, proffering that, you know, the morale of men and women, he said in one of his videos, who actually fight war is more important, that understanding how a human looks at code and other kinds of things is what made things like Fortran, you know, a winning kind of software. So he's kind of funny in, in referring to the human animal, while at the same, you know, almost in a condescending way, while at the same time promoting the highest ideals of being human. And that computers are not there for anything other than human insight. So that that I thought was amazing. And just to kind of summarize, I think some of his own thoughts were quite profound. He said, for instance, change does not mean progress, but progress requires change. This idea of setting Friday afternoons aside for great thoughts where you basically turn off some of what's going on around you to look at the bigger picture, I think was incredibly insightful. And then the other thing I thought was amazing was where he said, great people can tolerate ambiguity. They can both believe and disbelieve at the same time. And this is resonating in terms of the philosophy of science and Karl Popper, where Popper said, it's all about conjecture and refutation. And that a great scientist like uh, Einstein could both be imagining uh, something he's conjecturing while at the same time being very calculating in terms of making sure that what he's imagining can survive refutation. And over and over throughout the course, there were many, many passages that reinforced what I learned in philosophy of science, our large experimentation course, even some of the other ideas found in both quantitative and qualitative methodologies, he's hitting them over and over again. And I think if you actually take this course, the quotes I picked, you know, were, were some that I like, but there are so many others. And I, I think you're going to find these insights incredibly relevant and incredibly helpful in doing everything you do. And also this realization that all of us have an ability to actually move the needle and do what Steve Jobs said in terms of making a dent in the universe and where we're going and Hamming's challenge for all of us to do that struck me. And so Don, that's that's really you know, my recommendation. And I think it was very well facilitated over distance learning. All of the videos were instantly uh, watchable. They were reinforced by the uh, book. So I highly recommend the course. And that's it for me. Thank you, John, for a very insightful big picture there, particularly uh, for the course. OK, so let's see. Proceeding down the alphabet here, our, our next speaker is uh, Chris Cerullo, please. Let's follow uh, John's example. I thought giving a brief intro introduction for yourself was was a great practice. So please, Chris, it's all yours. Oh, OK, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Chris Cerullo and I'm a software engineer. I've been working on wireless networks at NYWIC for 15 years. And something that many of you may not know about me is that I was one of the worst students in my high school. Like of, of the people who actually graduated, I was probably in the bottom 2%. And for many years after high school, I, I didn't do much with my life. And there became a, a day when I, I realized that I have potential and I just completely squandered my potential. 
And from that day moving forward, I, I worked really hard to, to do good in school and to do good in the professional world. And I always wanted to maximize my, my potential and challenge myself. And so I have a lot of people that I look for up to for inspiration. People like uh, David Goggins, who's an incredible Navy SEAL who's accomplished a lot of things. And Richard Hamming falls right into that category of uh, inspirational people who have uh, motiv motivated me to try to be my best and to, that I could follow in their footsteps. So I've prepared this essay that, that I'll read to you all right now, and it's how did Richard Hamming help my research? So the introduction, the intent of this essay is to describe how the Hamming on Hamming course has helped my research. One of the main things I got out of the course was learning from Richard Hamming on how to conduct yourself as a scientist. This is per pertinent as I am currently going through the process of transitioning from engineer to scientist, and I'm experiencing frequent oscillations between self-doubt of having imposter syndrome and sometimes actually believing that I am the expert. As we go about our work of doing science and technology, we must interact with people in various parts of our organization who occupy dissimilar roles and have different goals. Social relationships are extremely important as you need people to help you with your research and you need to gain support and funding for your ideas. However, relationships are hard to manage and external influence can sometimes pull you off of your chosen path. One of the common themes in most of the Hamming lectures is that he described how he managed relationships with many different people in his community, which includes senior management, his peers, some of whom were Nobel Prize winners, and his subordinates. What I find striking is that one constant in all of these social relationships is the way Hamming presented himself. He did not change his philosophy based on the individuals he was working with. He was able to achieve the stability of character by developing many principles. So in this essay, I discuss three of these principles, which are number one, focus on style, Number two, focus on fundamentals. And number three, focus on leadership. So in style, in the very first lecture, Hamming declared that this is a course on style and that everyone should develop their own style. So how do you develop your own style? One way is to find mentors and people whom you admire and observe their style. You may not be able to directly imitate it, but you will be able to incorporate certain aspects of it and make it your own. So Hamming was a self-described janitor of science, and he was curious to understand the difference between a first class and a second class scientist. He believed that he fell in the second class category, so he was interested in studying the traits of first class scientists so that he could develop his own style of greatness. In pursuit of becoming great, he surrounded himself with great people and did not waste time. Hamming said, I want to be successful and I can't afford to waste my lunch times. So he recommends do work during lunch and choose who you eat with. This efficiency and targeted approach to work is the style that I appreciate and want to adopt because I understand from experience the downside of not adopting this style. Hamming warns us that uh, many people work hard, but they do not accomplish much. I understand this. The classic example he uses is the drunken sailor who wanders around but never gets anywhere. It is true, if you do not have a vision and a goal to focus on, you will wander around from project to project like a drunken sailor and eventually become obsolete. He encourages us by noting that the achievement of a goal is not the best part. It is the struggle and the day-to-day -day pursuit of greatness that counts. He says that most people agree that the struggle to achieve excellence is worth the effort. And he also states that great people believe they can do great work. If you don't believe you do, you can do great work, it is unlikely that you will do anything significant. So using Hamming as an inspiration, I will try to develop my own style by pursuing new friendships with people I admire and incorporating selected elements of their style into my own. So on fundamentals, why is focusing on fundamentals such an important topic? To begin with, Hamming cautioned us that there is a doubling of scientific knowledge every 17 years. It is impossible to know everything and keep up with that pace. To avoid being a drunken sailor and stay relevant, you must focus on fundamentals and choose your research topics wisely. A word of advice he gives is to, is to spend a little extra time on problems to make sure you have a deep understanding. 
According to Hamming, if you focus on the fundamentals, you can be efficient because you won't need to absorb all the reports and facts that are available in the literature. The fundamentals will allow you to derive other principles from the world and provide a way to reason through new discoveries. If you don't focus on the fundamentals, you can become a good scientist, but not a great one. If you want to be a great scientist, you must work on important problems. Focusing on the fundamentals will help you understand what the important problems are in your field. There is also a practical side to this. You must select problems that are tractable that you hope to be able to resolve. Hemming mentioned that nobody at Bell Labs worked on the problems of time travel, teleportation, and anti-gravity because they didn't have an attack vector. There were no fundamentals in place that would allow them to work on those problems. There are many problems in our field that may not have an attack vector, and we should be careful about spending our time on these killer problems. In this vein, Hamming points out that it is nice to work on great problems, but it is also important to work on small things. He said, plant small acorns that may grow into mighty oak trees. Other relevant quotes from Hamming are, the person who works the hardest does not always win. It is about working on the right problem at the right time, in the right way with an appropriate solution. There are a million races being run. You just have to get in one and win. So Hamming's advice really resonated with me because I have experienced it to be true. In my 20 year career, I have already seen knowledge in my field double once, and I know I cannot keep up with that pace by studying volumes of material. I may never become a first class scientist, but I will follow Hamming's advice and take some extra time to understand the fundamentals. And I believe that will help me choose good problems to work on and help me find good solutions. That is something that I can do. On the topic of leadership, uh, I'm extremely interested in, in leadership and there are many leadership styles. Although Hamming did not specifically mention it in his lectures, I believe he practices the style of leading by example. To me, that means try to become great and help others around you to become great themselves. This is how you can achieve efficient teamwork and build off of each other's magnificent work. It is difficult to practice leadership in many organizations because policies, processes, and other so social conventions will slow you down. Hamming provides great leadership advice by encouraging us to do the best you can with what you've got. Do not blame the system. During this class, I followed Hamming's leadership goal of trying to be your best and helping others around you to be their best as well. I had a wonderful experience sharing uh, these Hamming lessons with several college interns who worked in our lab over the summer. I asked them to watch the first video, you and your research, and then we discussed it. It was fun to listen to their interpretation of Hamming's lessons, and I gave them the choice of continuing to watch and discuss Hamming videos once per week or choosing a different topic. They were very enthusiastic and overwhelmingly chose to continue with Hamming videos. We watched one video each week and had great discussions every Monday morning. Some of the topics that they locked into were understanding the difference between school and work, focusing on fundamentals and personal development. At the end of the summer, let's see, at the end of the summer, the students told me that the part of their internship they enjoyed the most were the Hamming videos with career advice and mentorship that they received. They said it was unexpected and they were initially believed their internship would be all about coding and technical work. So I hope these lessons inspire and motivate them to become amazing students and scientists the same way they inspire me in my career. The topic of leadership is also important to me because at this point in my career, I don't believe that I will ever occupy a position of authority in my organization, and I don't believe I want or need one. Results matter in science and work. My strategy is that if I focus on fundamentals and personal development, I will have the necessary tools to successfully receive funding for my research ideas. Additionally, developing relationships and creating opportunities for others around me will make my research groups stand out and achieve better success. I believe that creating an environment of teamwork, cooperation, and trust, coupled with a clear vision for selecting good problems to work on, will lead to great discoveries. Quality work always bubbles up to the surface and will get recognition. I appreciate having creating this course. Without him, I would not have learned these things. And as, as he states in his powerful closing remarks, he says, nobody, 
And I mean, nobody told me these things. Nobody. I had to find them for myself. I have told you how to succeed. You have no excuse for doing better than I did. Thank you. And that was it. Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Chris. I was going to save it to Leanne. I'll toss it in now. We've during our course and previously we we all talked a little about imposter syndrome, which took me back at first, but it's definitely worth thinking about. Where I landed, and certainly your remark make great sense, Chris. Is well, wait a second. If we're all engineers trying to understand and learn, if we're all scientists trying to discover and understand, and reality is objective, who, who's impostering who? <laughs> so the, the attitude clears up so many things, and uh, thank you for articulating that. Okay, so let's transition now to our next speaker. Garrett, how you doing over there? Garrett Cookson, are you ready for us? I'm ready, and I apologize if the sound of tools happens in the background, but we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, oh, you sound good. Just the normal explosions, I think. All yeah, right, all, they're right. Not, they're all yours. A couple. There's a little bit of renovation going on, but it should be fine. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Garrett Cookson. So I. I have a bachelor's in mathematics and a master's in bioinformatics. I am a research scientist here at NYWIC and I've been on several different projects. Last year I was on a project, notably as a lot of people I've, I've shared this with, we were working with wearable data to see if we could use this wearable physiological data to ascertain whether someone was sick or healthy. That was a, a DARPA seedling project, and I'm interested in other kinds of applications of, of wearable health, wearable biosensors. I'm also interested in other kinds of naval health projects, and um, I, it looks like I'm going to be getting on another similar project soon, but more naval health and not as much wearables. Anyways, I feel like I'm trying to think if there's something new, but actually on, I really like what, what Chris said about imposter syndrome, because I just recently had that conversation with a friend and I sent him this article and I don't know how really helpful the article was, but basically it was just like, here's what you should do if you have imposter syndrome. And it was more of a, you know, put your feet on the ground, don't be too hard on yourself and just keep making steady pro progress. Anyways, his reaction was, what? You have imposter syndrome? Like he was just more of a, he just, he just like, I don't know. Like I, sometimes when you're hanging out with one person, they may feel that they exude confidence from you. And then when you hang out with another person, you might, they might feel that you're intimidated by what you're doing. So I noticed that depending on who you're with, like, and, and maybe what you're doing, like you never know what you're, you know, how, how people might interpret, like, you know, how you think about yourself. But, but I, I think that we all, from a distance, look perfected, kind of like the marble at, like, at the, uh, dang it, why am I, like at a museum, you know, like one of these Greek statues or whatever. But when you come in really, really close, that's when you see little cracks, and that's, that's us. We're the ones that look at ourselves with the, with uh, a magnifying glass and, and we're harder on ourselves and other people are on us. So I think I'm going to go ahead and I was going to kind of summarize, but I think I'll go ahead and read because mine's not too long, but mostly what mine mine is, is, uh, is questions. And the first part of it will describe why I focused on questions. In my first paper, I expressed my goals to learn and communicate at the PhD level. And 
while this class has contributed towards these goals, ultimately, this will be an ongoing process over the coming months, years, and even decades. Also in that paper, I discussed looking for the big questions. I attempted to boil them all down to a few questions, but the number of sections throughout the course just kept growing. Now, now here's a question. Why am I focused on finding the questions? At first, they can be valuable study aids. I've been I've been studying like this for a long time. The idea is to find all the questions and fill in the answers in preparation for a test. However, questions can serve a very different purpose in this class than they do in a, a bachelor's program or a master's. In most of these other realms, the questions have answers that must be found and memorized. And for the most part, that is that is what learning is at these levels. But at the PhD level, finding the questions is not about memorizing or filling in the answers. It's actually about appreciating the difficulty of hard philosophical and cutting edge research questions. In addition, when a good answer is argued or demonstrated for a hard question, one must appreciate the bounds and the context in which the answer comes and realize that different realize the different contexts will likely need a different answer. In this way, small focused contributions to knowledge can be produced. Furthermore, after this class, I have a greater appreciation for languages of clear thinking, such as mathematics, chemistry, programming, semantics. Hard questions often need precise language in order to bring questions and potential solutions into focus as well as to make progress in a clear, communicatable way. Here are some of the questions from the class. I'll be re I will be revisiting these questions again and again, and I'm confident that this list will grow and change over time. And also, I just want to add before I start reading the questions, and actually I can, I can share the questions, why not? That I, I really like what, what what John was saying about like you have you can consider more than one answer at once. You can be comfortable with uh, ambiguity. It's this is not about memorizing uh, answers. This is about appreciating that that questions can be hard. And again, like when you do hear someone argue a really good solution, you have a better appreciation appreciation for it. But yeah, these questions were inspired by a lot of the things that we talked about in, in class. What is learning? Is, is this strictly a human activity? Does AI learn? What does it mean to learn something new? What is thinking? Is this, strict, is this strictly a human activity? Does AI think? What does it mean to think a new thought or develop a new idea? What is foundational knowledge in science or in information science? How does one stay current in rapidly developing fields? What does it mean to make a contribution to knowledge? That's a really good question we could think we should think about. What does it mean to be an expert, a generalist, a polymath, or a kook? What rules do each play? Who is sought after the most? Who, must, who most often contributes new ideas? Who generally produces the breakthroughs? Who strives to contain, control, or protect the field from changing or detouring excessively? What does it mean to think outside of the box? How does one balance a firm understanding of foundational knowledge and curiosity to look outside the box? How far outside the box can one go before becoming a kook? Or should, or should some kookiness be embraced? What is creativity? How does one become more creative? How does one balance adherence to foundational knowledge without losing their creativity? How does one approach challenging foundational knowledge in a way that can be taken seriously? Can foundational knowledge be broken? Can it be bent? What rules 
does a firm understanding of boundary conditions play in understanding, breaking, or bending foundational knowledge? What is the language of clear thinking? What are some examples? Does a perfect language of clear thinking exist or can one exist? What is reliable data or does it exist? When is data good enough to be useful? Or is any data useful? What is meant by useful? What is a simulation? What is reduction reductionism? What is what is systems research? How can quality simulation research and development contribute to reductionist and systems type experiments? Or what can simulations tell one about the parts? And what can it tell one about the whole? So, so yeah, I think that this will just continue to be a process. And as we jump into our next assignment at work or into our dissertation, some of these questions will come up as we're building our models and as we're building our theories, and we will have to take a stand on things and we will have to build a strong argument. And we're also gonna have to have that thick skin because people are gonna throw arrows at it. <laughs> And then, you know, a couple of us, uh, a couple of us will get like the attaboys or the girls were like, hey, you did a good job, you know, so we're going to get, you know, compliments and we're going to get ridicule. But either way, like we need to we need to keep up the fight and we need to build knowledge. So uh, that's it for me. Wow, thank you, Garrett. Pretty awesome. Boy, top 10 questions too. I never saw those on Letterman. I, I gotta say, uh, very serious questions. Thank you. Well, Letterman okay. hasn't asked me to go on a show yet, so. Or, oh wait, no. he's gone now, huh? Okay, everybody. Great thinking. Okay, our, our next speaker then is Carlos Flores Molina. Carlos, floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Don. So to provide the audience a bit of my background, I am an electrical engineer, uh, had a bachelor's and master's in double E. And following my studies, my career spans uh, 13 years, uh, 10 of those at Nightwick, more or less. And I am part of the cohort three, as we all are here, all the students of the IS uh, PhD program. And my motivation to take uh, Hamming's class was uh, looking for mentorship. And of course, barring the opportunity to directly interact with Hamming, the second best option is to get immersed in his works as, as much as we can. And when I saw that Don was gracious and facilitated a class which included lectures with videos and discussions, um, so I enrolled in it. And not only because I could read about him and, and, and learn from his book, which anybody can do, but also because we had the chance to talk to like-minded students uh, facilitated by a professor. And stemming from that, I identified two central themes about what I learned from this class. One was motivation, and the other one is guidance. And more specifically, when we talk about guidance, uh, for me personally, it was which problems to work on and revisiting uh, fundamentals, even for the smaller things. So the lessons from learning to learn have not only changed my current research, but I believe that it will also change my career path. Even when I revisit passages from Hamming's book, I find myself thinking I should really remember to do more of that. 
And while a lot of the lessons are common sense, it's sometimes surprising how much of that common sense applies to Hamming as it does apply to mere models like ourselves. And about motivation, really, I would not have guessed that Hamming himself failed imposter syndrome. Seems like it's a, a popular topic for today's talks. But I would not have guessed that he felt imposter syndrome when he first started working at Bell Labs. I think a dose of uh, imposter syndrome is really healthy for any professional. And as you get more experience and more knowledge, you're actually more likely to develop imposter syndrome rather than uh, Dunning-Kruger. But what is more important really is the response to our own perceived weaknesses. Not only is the motivation from Hamming's lessons applicable to our career, but also the auto lessons are important so that we can maximize the impact of our research. And I identified a duality when Hamming was trying to motivate us when he describes the profile, uh, the profile of a great scientist. On the one hand, he talks about preparation, hard work, and a history of great achievements is starting at an early age. When he talks about uh, Einstein and some of his fellow scientists at Bell Labs. So it, in a way, it is a reality check. But on the other hand, he also talks about luck favoring the prepared mind for any age, really. And the other side of the coin, he uh, brings up the example of Bill, Bill Fan, who's a uh, very famous for zone melting and this was highly impactful in the development of semiconductors and i will paraphrase hamming when he said that bill fan seemed to me then to not to know much mathematics to be articulate or to have a lot of clever brains but i had already learned that brains come in many flavors and forms and to be aware of ignoring any chance I got to work with a good man. So I will I will leave it up to the audience to look up um, in more detail fans achievements, but I'll just say that I would uh, be very happy to be half as successful as uh, Bill Fan was. Another uh, part of motivation uh, was the random walk problem that I think uh, John mentioned. And even when we don't know where to aim, it's better to aim somewhere than to walk randomly. And of course, uh, Hamming uh, gave a quick back of the envelope proof by walking us through a random walk and the efficiency of aiming somewhere versus just randomly walking. And he gave us an analogy of intellectual development as compound interest. And that, that resonates with me uh, because just like all of us, we're relatively later in our career starting a PhD program. And it resonates that having said, I will never be as good or be able to work as efficiently as uh, John Tukey. And this might not be paraphrasing, but uh, the message was that he still he still could be the better version of himself and he could do a lot better than if he didn't take this approach of compound interest because the race in science is not about uh, just working hard but also thinking about where you're going uh, working on the right problems and let that interest uh, compound over the years so both the is phd program and the Hamming class have encouraged me to stop and think about the problems I've been working on. At first, uh, my approach was, well, what's what's the tiniest bit of improvement I can do on my own research, and then and then just call it a day. And at, at least for now, I, I don't I don't see myself taking exactly that path. I have stopped and have looked at adjacent problems, some of the problems that at first I would have thought they have nothing to do with each other, and consider what other applications they could have and what the impact could have. And finally, the recurring theme 
thing in all of Hammond selectors is, is to always be concerned about the fundamentals. And there are three reasons to do that. First, as Hamming pointed out, the fundamentals of a field are unlikely to change for a long time. And learning them well will allow us to have a basis on which we can keep up with the changes in our field. A second reason also closely related to the first one is that knowing the fundamentals can empower us to innovate because it is when we push near the lim limits bounded by the fundamentals that we can come up with true innovation. And third, uh, reasoning with fundamentals allows us to communicate with people in other fields more easily. Hammy provides examples of this situation over and over, even when he talks about the development of research and technology, the S curve, and sometimes even bringing differential equations to everyday problems. I, I conclude uh, that in my own research, when I'm trying to apply all the lessons that I've mentioned above, and more specifically taking a step, step back in my approach and exploring more challenging topics that I have initially envisioned, Hammy was uh, uh, definitely influential in a very positive way. And it's uh, one way that requires me uh -huh. to review the fundamentals. Sorry, is that a in a way that not only requires me to review the fundamentals, but also to stop and ask myself if the current path I'm taking is the best one, given the, my goals. Great stuff, Carlos. Good job, Carlos. Thank you, Carlos. Extremely stimulating. I shared a picture from earlier in this course that John took. We took of John holding uh, that very same sailor's simulated random walk and the importance of having a goal. So appreciate your highlighting that. OK, so what do you do when you have? Four impossible, impossibly great acts to follow. <laughs> well, that's easy. You just take. Jessica Kimball, who's fresh off her. <laughs> I, I thought you were very gentle with the committee, actually, Jessica. So that was good. That was oh, great. boy. Yeah. <laughs> you think they were gentle on me? I think so. <laughs> uh, well, I, I missed the. Uh, the uh, jittery middle part, but oh, uh, I'm sure you did just great. And yeah. certainly everybody thought so afterwards. And well, I keep so, rerunning it in my head like, ah, anyway. OK, so all yours, Jessica. All right. Well, yeah, so we're here to talk about hamming. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I was a little kicking and screaming when we got into this course, um, to be honest, because I was like, what did I just sign up for? And, you know, we, we'd all kind of talked about getting together just to have conversations, and I was all for that. But then, you know, in the midst of getting ready for exams and everything, we started talking about make, doing essays. I was like, no, I don't have time for that. Hold on. But you know, I am glad that I did take the time to write up my thoughts and and so let me share them. And I think you know that that's actually where I'll just start is is you know think great thoughts, write them down, and sharing them. I think personally, I was a little I can be a little close hold with information or shy, or it, you know, <laughs> in a social setting, not shy. But sometimes I you know just am am, am not confident enough, I guess, in my answers to give my own opinion on things. Um, so I think that that's something that, you know, I've gleaned from this hamming, ham, all these hamming, you, you know, if I, there, there's no purpose in doing work in isolation and not sharing it. And, you know, it's kind of that, the man in the arena quote that I've, I've brought up before with the, it's the critic that counts and, you know, the person who's in the arena with the 
dust and sweat, blood and, te blood and tears on there, you know, who keeps try trying again and again is the one that, that, you know, knows the most, but he's in there willing to get tomatoes thrown at, at him or what Garrett said earlier, right? The arrows. So I, I have to be a little bit more willing to take those criticisms because you know they're not that they're not as as scary, and I think everything everybody always means well. So anyway, that was definitely a good mindset shift for me, as well as just like the Fridays and or any any time dedicated in, within the week that you can actually dedicate to professional development, personal growth. I just think that that's so important. With you know what he says about nobody told him these things and how to learn. He went out and learned all, learned all of these things himself, you know, and there's, well, what are we learning ourselves that we now need to share with the next generation? And I, and I really liked that he said something about, do not assume that the world that you grew up in is the same world for the next generation. And, you know, having somebody who has a 20-year-old and a 10-year-old and, you know, like I, that has never been more true. Um, so... You know the the world is different for the younger eyes and the new technical problems that they face, and so we need to kind of have an open mindedness to listen and receive their input, and you know be willing to change our minds even in even as a as a you know quote unquote expert who is strong in the fundamentals. You know, we should always be working to grow in our own knowledge of the fundamentals fundamentals and think outside of the box. And so with, with the creativity videos that he goes to, I just keep kind of going back to where how, I think within our, our cohort of PhD students within information sciences, there's about six or seven of us who are, are musicians or, or who actually like music or have some sort of creative outlet. And you kind of get to thinking, well, why is that? Well, maybe scientists and, na and engineers are naturally creative and there's some sort of right brain left brain bridge thing going on that enables us to solve problems by thinking outside of the box while working within you know a certain paradigm still so anyway just kind of a, a fun thought that I had there but let's see the I liked his quotes on you know if you don't work on important problems it's not likely that you'll do important work so I think you have to have passion in everything that you do, whether it's your work or your research. And if you're not into it, well, why are you doing it? You know, the, I was watching a Black Holes documentary thinking, should I just, now that I passed my role, should I just go crazy and study Black Holes? Kidding. I'm still a knowledge graph girl. Uh, <laughs> geek, but, you know, that was like, you know, now that we have like kind of the license to research, it's just a fun, um, a fun thought that, you know, you're, you're the only one that can restrict yourself um, in your own thinking. And so, you know, and just back to the communication and the, uh, there's a lot of value, I think Richard Hamming, you know, in, in plainly stating a problem, a goal, or, uh, you know, working through something with, with others. Because if you can get more buy-in from the community that you're working within, you know, that can, it can, it can get better, or you can have more people helping you through a certain goal. I like what Chris said too about Going to lunch, being care. Uh, what did he say? The going to lunch with people. Choose who you go to lunch with and do professional development at lunch. So I'm sure that's why he's gone with me to lunch so many times. Just kidding. <laughs> but no, I I think you know we definitely have. If we had a thing called grunch where we would talk about graphs at lunch, and you know, Garrett's invited to that too. Now that our uh, tests are over, maybe we can resurrect our our graph lunch. Um, you know, nerd lunch that we were having, which is just, you know, get together and talk about anything technical. It doesn't have to just be graphs. So, uh, you know, two other things that I, I kind of have in here about unreliable data and you get what you measure. That's the number one criteria for validity and research is is that you have you you're, that you are getting you're measuring what you intended to measure. So um, he says, beware of finding what you were looking for, right? So um, and I like that you know if you don't set up your experiment correctly and take into consideration those types of things, you might not you might be surprised by the outcomes and therefore maybe not as yeah. So unreliable data too. I'm I'm 
passionate about, you know, training machine learning with reliable representative data, whether it's in a classified environment or not. So yeah, and then I, you know, definitely all the leadership takeaways. I, I mentioned it earlier about just trying to pass on what we've learned now and, you know, trying to become great and help others around you become great. You know, I think it's great that uh, Chris had that opportunity to teach his interns. I for sure have been telling everybody about Richard Hamming. It's how does how do people not know who he is? He's a legend, you know. So, and so I think you know, kind of practicing these elevator pitches about well, he was this you know very accomplished man, but he was also quite humble, and he shared these insights um, just about human interaction. You know, working within the tech technology um, and science and engineering disciplines, and how he how he grew and navigated out of that as a you know second class <laughs> scientist, whatever that means. But yeah, I think I think he's a lot for us all to look up to. You know, I definitely personally have taken the the challenge on of trying to do better than he did, right? <laughs> Not that I, I, you know, think I can at this point, but, you know, just, just sure, challenge accepted, we'll try. And, you know, he says, you have no excuse not to do better than I did now, so go <laughs> forth and do good things, think good work, uh, think good thoughts and write them down and share them. That's it. Very good, Jessica. <laughs> Really great, thank you all. Thank you, Jessica, for those uh, insights. Let me see if I can click a button here. There we go, okay. Well, I, I gotta say this might, might be the most powerful panel of working scientists on the planet, you guys, so uh, bravo. Uh, looks like we still have Marty, we have uh, John Durham, might have missed Tom. We went pretty long for working uh, head of the library, but I'm sure we'll have comments later that will feed back to us. So any, any questions from the assembled spectators peering up at this magnificent group of working scientists learning to learn? Go for okay, it, Marty. Martin. Go ahead, Martin. You're, you're muted. Don told me to mute. I muted. I listened to the professors. <laughs> um, I am blown away compared to the three previous semesters, John, when Don Brussman allowed me to participate. You all come a, f a long way, and congratulations to those of you who passed your orals. I remember that was the hardest part. <laughs> Believe me when I tell you, when you know you're ready for your defense, it will be your easiest part, because mm -hmm. you will be the expert on your field of research. Whatever time limits you have, this is the, your time to dig deeply. And so I'm giving you a 15 second motivational speech. Try to clear your plate of personal and other things. You don't have to take classes anymore. You don't have to sleep oh, a little bit. Don't eat too much. Get up early and I'll give you two bits of advice. When you wake up, grab your keyboard, your iPad, pencil and paper, and write down whatever's in your head for five minutes, 300 seconds. It's called morning call. As an author, I was taught the power of it. Even if you say, crazy Marty wanted me to write down, I have nothing to write down. This is stupid, he's an idiot and his hair's all white. Your brain for four, six, eight hours was working while you were sleeping. There may be a sentence, a phrase, a nugget, an idea. 30 minutes later, you will not be able to recapture what's in your brain. 
Item one, capture for 300 seconds. Number two, use powerful tools like EndNotes or whatever when you're doing your dissertation. I had two master's students and one doctoral student, and I just finished my fourth book. I wish I had taken my own advice over the period of time of writing. You're gonna have references. You're gonna have to learn to reference or you're a plagiarist. You're gonna learn how to use a quote carefully and delicately because no one wants to read a two page quote. You're going to learn a word I only learned three years ago. Paraphrase. Read two pages by Don Brutzman on something and cut it to four of your sentences. To do that, you have to know where he's coming from. Those are my two bits of advice towards your research. By the way, I'm retired. I mentor people to the degree that the school, it's OK with the school. I'm a no charge mentor. Back to you, Don. Marty, thanks. Could you, while we have you on camera here, could you please tell everybody about the Hamming biography you've I uh, pursued so diligently? Can I, can I share screen? Please. OK, how do I do that here? Up arrow, share, share tray. I am going to share this. Is that presenting a tribute? Do you see this? Yes, looking good. Excellent. There it is. Okay. On the 24th of October, my grandson and I went to the U University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign and presented this speech, this presentation. By the way, Don, this should be up in YouTube with captions before the end of this week. So you asked me the status. Hamming lectured, Hamming graduated the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign 80 years ago this year. He taught at Princeton 70 years ago this year. He taught at Stanford 60 years ago this year. He came to the postgraduate school in 1976. The biography I've completed He's a mathematician, a computer scientist, an educator, a polymath, a laureate, and my good friend. And I learned a tremendous amount. Don, I'll share this presentation and others can see it offline. I don't want to take all the time, but if I can show one other thing, is this Please. shared now the word preface? Please. Okay. You know what Hamming was? Here's a picture of him a year before he died. And I talk about Hamming and what was my motivation and what is the legacy and what is the book. OK, now am I sharing preface? Yes. Thank you. This is Hamming in 1996. Um, I'll let you scan this and I'll put this up. Um, there, there was not a biography of Hamming. I had the pleasure of interviewing 15 people who knew him all the way back to 1958. And I felt that who he influenced was more important. So the tribute is not just what he accomplished. Top of page two. Carl Sagan's book on Cosmos, which I recommend to you, talks about a book is magic. It proves that mankind can do magic because the author takes you across leagues and centuries where he wants it to go. I discovered the people who influenced Hamming. I've got a lot of photographs and pictures and stories and videos. Books 85,000 words, 485 pages, and all of the things I collected are at Calhoun at the Navy Postgraduate School, an open archive. Working on this biography was the hardest thing I've ever done but it helped me better understand his impact now and for the future. I'll be glad to end. The book is in final layout. Uh, Carla, my uh, editor, coach, will be looking at it momentarily. And my intent is to have it for sale in hardback and ebook by the second week of December. And Marty, is that going to be on Amazon? 
No, I'm doing it direct. I as part of the legacy project. I said Amazon is phase three. I'm, okay. I'm going to do 500 signed numbered legacy first editions. I'm going to sell them and all proceeds will go to. Don, it looks like it's going to be University of Illinois. NPS has not come back with a willingness to work with me on this. It's not over, but the, I'm setting up a foundation at the University of Illinois Urbana for uh, all profits from the book, plus an endowment for me to allow to pay for travel expenses for students who want to present at conferences. I'm Great. taking I'm taking nothing out of the book. Hamming gave me enough. Wow, thanks. Appreciate it. Very good. Yeah, you mind uh, unsharing? Uh, Marty Stand will up. maybe take your group picture and uh, stop sharing. Uh, yeah, uh, John, you got something for us or? Uh, can we at least count on you in a future uh, iteration here? Oh, uh, that would de probably depend on how well I do on exams here soon, Don. Oh, OK. So, and yeah. you have a direct impact on that. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, I get to watch. Uh, and. Uh, well, that's a better answer than depends on the election, maybe, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you cost other people too money, too much money to fail, John. So don't worry, you're going to do great. Do oh, okay, great. thanks. Okay, I'll hang so, my hat on that. Uh, <laughs> let me uh, take another screenshot here. So there's a little acronym that is pretty interesting. Sorry, my my mouse runneth away. Your screen is frozen, Don. Try that. Yeah. John, could you uh, lift your head up a little bit? You're getting blocked by your uh, letter. Oh, perfect. OK, one sec. It's in here somewhere. I know he's taking a picture. Yeah, this is uh, photography in the modern age, I think. I'll read, everybody Thanks, do the John, John Durham. So, so the four letters I think uh, we're not going to have to worry about are TLDR. Too long, didn't read. You guys are totally interesting. And so you really hit it out of the park in terms of helping other students decide if they want to pursue this journey, that it's not trivial, but it's really rewarding. And as Marty showed us first person, the fun never ends. So let me thank each of you. Why don't we thank each other and call it another great fun hey. All right. afternoon. All right. Thank you to Marty for for writing an autobiography on him. That's so, so, yeah. so really great. Cool. Or, I, hopefully, it's, hopefully it's not an autobiography, but a biography. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>